All right, so we left off in class calculating standard deviation by hand. We will go through a couple more examples by hand just to get the process down and understand um, how we actually calculate the standard deviation. Then we're going to actually learn how the calculator does it and use that. It's a lot faster. So this example, you should have it provided for you. We want to calculate the standard deviation of the following sample by hand and then with a the calculator. So we have this data set. And the very first thing to know is how many items do we actually have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So n is equal to eight. We had eight data items. And when we're dealing with finding the standard deviation, we're trying to figure out, on average, how far away from the mean each of these data points are, on average. So the very first thing to calculate actually is the mean. What is it, and how do we get there? So, going for the mean, x bar, since it's a sample, how do we get there? We sum all of our data values and divide by the number that we have, number of items. So the sum of 40, 32, 29, 27, 22, 18, 9, and 7, we get 184. And you can double check my work with your calculator. And again, we're finding the average of 8 items, so we divide by 8. So the average or the mean for this data set is 23. That's important. We need that in the beginning because now we want to figure out, well, how far away, how many deviations away from 23 is 7, and specifically in which direction, on the left-hand side of the mean or on the right-hand side of the mean. So draw yourself a nice little table like this. Pause it if you have to. Then come back, and we will fill in the chart. So first thing to look at, what actually are the data values that are present? So we had 8 to work with. I've got 7, 9, 18, 22, 27, 29, 32, and 40. All right, so again, we have the mean. We have to figure out how far away from the mean are each of these data points. We want to know what is the deviation. So again, how do we get the deviation? We take our data value, we call those x, and we subtract off what? Our mean, our average, x bar. So the data value minus the mean tells me how many deviations away it is and in which direction. So if I take 7 minus 23, we get negative 16 for our deviation. It's 16 units away from the mean, and it's negative, which tells me it's to the left of the mean. It's less than. All right, 9 minus 23, we get negative 14. 18 minus 23 is still negative, since it's to the left. Negative 5. 22 is pretty close. It's still to the left of the mean by one unit, so negative 1. 27 is in the positive direction. It's over the mean, specifically by four units. 29 is over by six. 32 is over by nine, and 40 is over by 17. So we know the deviations, how far away from the mean are each of those data values. Okay, and the plus and the minus again tells us which direction. Left is negative, right is positive. Okay, but if we sum all of these, again, what does that sum result? The sum of the deviations, sum of deviations should be zero. They all cancel each other out. Okay, so to circumvent that problem, what did we do with each of those deviations? We squared them. So squared deviations. Negative times negative is a positive. We get rid of that problem of canceling them all out. So 16 times 16, we get 256. 14 squared, 196. 5 squared, we get 25. 1 squared, we get 1. 16, 36, 81, and 289. All right, so we got the mean. We figured out how far away each data value was from the mean squared all those. So now we have all positive values here. And we want to find what is the average of these squared deviations. 
So again, to find an average, what do we do? Sum them all together. But with the standard deviation, we don't divide by the number of items that we have. We always do one less. Okay, so we're looking for the sum of, how do we want to describe it? The deviations that were squared. Easy enough notation. We call this the variance. So the variance, what does it look like? If I sum all of these together, what do we get? So let's add them. We got 256, 196, 25, 116, 36, 81, and 289. So that's 900 altogether. The sum of the squared deviations. And we're dividing it by what? I had eight data items. We always pick one less. So we've got eight data items. We pick one less. So I'm looking at 900 divided by 7. So that's approximately 128.57. That's our variance. We want the standard deviation. So the variance is just the stuff underneath the radical. Because throughout the process, we squared everything. So we want to undo that at the end. So the standard deviation, S, is the square root of 128.57, which is approximately what? 11.3. So on average, each of these data values, on average, is 11.3 units away from the mean, from 23. This is the average deviation from the mean. Okay, so we calculated it by hand. We got that. It's manageable. It's just a process. It's a little bit lengthy. Okay, but the calculator can do it for us. So pull out your hopefully 84, 86, something similar, and we'll run through that process of having the calculator do the work for us. It's a lot faster. So the very first thing that we actually want to do, you have the directions, the steps in front of you, is input our data set into the calculator. So how do we do that? We go into STAT, and we want to select the Edit option. And you might have some data already inputted in there, maybe on accident or you're borrowing a calculator. So to clear that out, what has to happen? So go all the way to the top, whatever list you're on, L1, L2, L3. I've only got two shown. But we'll press clear when it's on the list and then press the down arrow. And that will clear the entire list. You won't have to delete everything by hand. Okay, so again, I'll clear out list one, go all the way up to the top where it's highlighted, list one, press clear, and then down. Okay, so now we have a blank slate to work with, and we want to input our data values. So every single entry we'll input and then press enter. So seven is the first, then we had nine, 18, 22, 27, 29, 32, and 40. So we inputted the data. We have eight items. Now we actually have to tell the calculator we want the standard deviation. So go back into statistics, that stat button, and we want to go over to calculate instead now. And we've only inputted one list of data. So we want to select the one variable statistics. If we were maybe comparing the standard deviations of two different lists, we could select two variable statistics, and it would calculate them both at the same time. But we only have one in there, so go down to the very first option, one variable stats. Hit enter to select it. So we've called that command, and now we want to execute it. We want to run it. So click enter again. And what does it give us? So we have to kind of decipher uh, the different notation that's on a calculator, but it's pretty standard. So our mean, what does our mean look like? Still the same thing, x bar is represented with our mean. And uh, the calculator said the mean of this data set was 23. We calculated it by hand, got the same value. So the calculator's version, again, is just x bar, tells us the mean. So, so far we verified, we get the same information. And the next two we don't really care about. Those are just the summation as we go along about the different x values, our different data values. 
But what we want is the sample standard deviation or the population standard deviation. So we're always assuming that these are going to be samples unless it's explicitly told to us that it's a population. All right, so the notation for the sample standard deviation is little s x. So again, our typical notation for sample standard deviation, but it just tells us which variable we're looking at. Because in this case, we only ran one list. Excuse me. But if we ran two lists, then we would have the standard deviation of y as well. And if we had another one, standard deviation of z. Okay, so this is just the first list. So the standard deviation for the sample was approximately 11.3, which is what we calculated by hand. So again, that notation gives us the sample standard deviation. If we had behaved like this was a population, that's our next option that's given to us. So sigma of x instead of sx, this tells me we're dealing with the population. It's a little bit different, about 10.6. That would be our population standard deviation. But again, we're assuming they're all samples unless explicitly told. All right, and then n equal to 8 again tells us what? Same story that we talked about in the beginning. I've got eight data items in there. So the calculator is super helpful because what we did by hand in probably 10 minutes, the calculator did in two seconds. And we still have the same amount of accuracy. All right, so the previous example, the data set was pretty small. We only had eight items. But what if we're given something like a frequency distribution and we're trying to figure out the standard deviation from the mean in this case? So let's take a look. The different data values that we've collected, the number 2, 3, 4, and 5. Okay, so 2 occurred how many times? 5, 3 occurred 8 times, 4 occurred 10 times, and 5 occurred twice. So we could physically write out the data set if we needed to. If we can't see exactly what's going on, write out the data value, the number of times that it shows up, shows you the data set. Okay, but we want to work more efficiently in our chart here. So let's go for these sums. We have to figure out what is the actual mean first before we can find the deviation from the mean. So in order to do that, we have to figure out, well, how many data items do we actually have? So if we add up all the frequencies together, we get 25. So we have 25 data items, and again, we get that value by counting the frequency, the number of times that the things show up. So in order to get the average, we sum all of them and divide by the number of items that we actually have. <coughs> but with a frequency distribution, how many times is 2 actually showing up? 5 times. So if we sum all of the 2's together, we take our value times the frequency, how much weight or how many point values are all of the 2's worth? Ten of them. Okay, because my two shows up five times, so if I add together five twos, I get ten. So we're just kind of doing individual sums before a good, uh, an overall good sum. Okay, so three shows up eight times. Eight times three is twenty-four. If we sum all of the threes together, if we sum all of the fours together, there's ten of them. So we have forty points coming from all of the fours. And then from the fives, there's only two of them. So if we sum all the fives together, we've got 10. So when we add all of the values together, what do we have in this case? So 40, 50, 60, 70, 84. So the sum of all of the data items is 84. And in total, we have 25 of them. So to calculate the average, or x bar, we assume it's a sample, so the sample mean. We take the sum of all of our data values and divide it by what? 25, the number of items that we have. So our average is 3.36. Okay, and it's reasonable for our data values, somewhere in the middle. So we always have that check. So now we know what the mean, what the average is. Now we want to figure out, well, what's the deviation from the mean? for each of these data values. So again, how do we find the deviation? 
we take the data values, which we always call them x, and what do we remove from it? x bar, the mean. Because we want to figure out, is it to the left, is it to the right, and by how much. So if I take 2 minus 3.36, we get negative 1.36. So this data value is to the left of the mean, since it's negative, and it's left of the mean 1.36 units. All right, 3 is still to the left of this mean, so it will be negative. And if we look at the difference, we get negative 0.36. 4 is now to the right of the mean. It's larger than this number, so it'll be positive. So 4 minus 3.36 gives us 0.64, positive 0.64 units away from the mean. And 5 is to the right as well, it'll be positive. 5 minus 3.36, what do we get? 1.64. Okay, again, if we sum all of the deviations, what should we get? Zero. They all cancel each other out. So we have to square all of those deviations to get rid of the positives and the negatives canceling. So negative times a negative will give us a positive. 1.36 squared, what do we get? We got 1.8496. Okay, we'll do that for all of them. Squaring this deviation, 0.1296. Positive, we're getting rid of those problem children with the negatives. 0.64 squared is 0.4096, and you can double check on your calculators. And lastly, 1.64, we get 2.6896. Squared all of the deviations. All right, so we have the deviations, the squared deviation from the mean, for the data value 2. But this is calculated for only one of them. And how many data values of 2 did we actually have within our set? Five of them. So my square deviation for 1, 2 is 1.8496. So what is going to be my square deviation for all five of them? Okay, because I have five 2's showing up, each deviating by this much. So in total, if we multiply 5 times 1.8496, we get 9.248. So again, the square deviation was just individual for one two, and we have five of them. So in total, all of the twos, they deviate this much in total. Same story for three. Three deviates this much, but how many threes did we have in that data set? eight of them. So eight times our squared deviation gives us 1.0368. The total deviation from all of the threes, not just one of them. We had eight of them. All right, next, the four deviated this much, but again, this is for one, and we have how many fours? Ten of them. So ten times this value, we just move the decimal point, 4.096 total deviation from all of the fours. Okay, five deviated this much, one five deviated this much, and we have two of them. So two times this value, we get 5.3792. So we could physically do it individually and write out the entire data set, calculate it individually, sum all of those, and get to these values. But if we can do it in one file swoop, we might as well. All right, so we have our mean. We know where the middle is. We know how far each of them deviate. We squared it to get rid of the negatives and the positives. Okay, and then we summed all of the deviations in a kind of one nice column. So let's go for standard deviation then. Square root of what? Our variance. So the sum of all of the squared deviations so we have to add all of these together. So if we take the sum of these four rows, we get 19.76. So the total deviation. So we take that value, 19.76, and we divide it by what? One less than the number of data items that we have. So the sum of all of our frequencies gave us n. 
and we want n minus 1. So 25 minus 1 is 24. So we're looking for square root of 19.76 divided by 24, which is 0.91. All right, so what does this tell us then? On average, how far away from the mean are each of these data values on average? 0.91 units away. So on average, how far away from the mean? The average of all the deviations is our standard deviation. And again, the part underneath the square root, we call that the variance. The standard deviation is when we take the square root at the end. Because we've squared everything, we have to undo that. Okay, so we have our value 0.91 for our standard deviation. And let's just run through how to do this on a calculator real quick. So actually, I don't know how to do a proper frequency distribution. We, when you tell the calculator, well, I had five twos. What we just do is input the data like that. So again, what happens? Go into statistics, and we want to edit our list. And you probably still have the previous one in there. So scroll to the top where the list is selected, press clear, and then press down. It'll clear out everything. And we want to input our data. So I had a data value of two, and it showed up five times. So we can input two, one, two, three, four, five times. Okay, three showed up eight times, so we'll input three, eight times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Four showed up ten times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And five showed up twice. Five, five. There's probably a better way to do frequency distributions with the calculator. I quite I haven't figured it out yet, but if you can play around and figure it out, awesome. Share it with us Tuesday when we come back. But if not, this still gets us there. And I think it's a little bit easier to understand the concept of what our data set actually looks like when we input it like this. All right. So in total, we can check. List 1 tells me I have how many items in there? 25 of them. And we have the sum of all the frequencies, 25. Just a little check. So we inputted our data. Go back to statistics. Over to calc. Calculate. And we only inputted one list, so we want to select one variable statistics. And we need it to execute that command, so run it by hitting enter. And we can look at our data and verify, did it match by what we did by hand? So x bar, our average, 3.36, we have the same there. Sx is our uh, standard deviation, and we had to round a little bit when we calculated the square root of this variance, but pretty darn close. If we round the standard deviation, in this case, to two decimal places, like we did by hand, we get 0.91. We have a population standard deviation, but again, we're assuming that it's a sample. And equal to 25 tells me I did actually input the correct number of data items. All right, so I try to convey the picture of the tomatoes and the targets. Yours are obviously better. My tomatoes are sad, but it gets the point across. So the central tendency and the dispersion, or the spread, those are kind of interchangeable. The spread are different, and they're independent aspects that depend solely on the situation. So we're going to look at these two examples and kind of discuss the differences between them. So with the tomatoes, each basket has 12 tomatoes in it, and it costs the same. So we're not talking about weight, we're talking about the number of tomatoes that are in there. They both have 12 and they cost the same. Okay, so the box or the basket that has larger tomatoes in it along with the smaller ones is going to have what to offer? More volume of tomatoes, so a higher average in this case. If we take the average of all of the weights of the tomatoes, we have a higher average here. Okay, but maybe I'm cooking a recipe and I cook for a restaurant and I'm going to cut up tomatoes and put them on burgers. 
I don't want to have a really small one and then a really giant one and then a really small one again and another giant one. We want better consistency or lower dispersion, lower spread. So the second example where the tomatoes are more uniform would give us actually that lower dispersion. So if I'm making soup and I'm going for quantity of tomatoes and I'm going to chop them up anyway, I would probably want to buy this first basket because I have more to offer. We have a higher average, more weight of tomatoes. Okay, but again, if we want consistency, we would want to pick the one with lower dispersions. Okay, one that's more similar, likewise, with the tomatoes. All right, next example with the targets. You could kind of see how the two people performed, and maybe it's the same person, probably not, but anyway. The first one, what happens? We have those four or five different points. If I take the average of all of those points, it's halfway decent. So if we look at it in terms of a Cartesian grid and I kind of split it into four different pieces, the average happens at the point three-fifths, three-fifths. So pretty small and positive and pretty darn close to the center target. So that'd be about right here is the average. Make it a little square. So there's our average. So the average really isn't far off from the center. Okay, we have a good average in this case. Good average. But what about the dispersion? What about the spread? It's all over the place. So we have a large dispersion. Okay, the second person. If I take the average of these four points, the average is still going to be pretty well contained around those same values. So we have a poor average in terms of getting close to the center of the target. But what about the dispersion in that case? They're really close together. We have a low dispersion. So which one would be more desirable? The second one, because that would be easier to correct. This person needs to work on their marksmanship. This person just needs to sight in their rifles, just to off a little bit. So our good consistency, our low dispersion, is more desirable than having just a good average. Because on average, yeah, they're pretty close, but this person is way more accurate. So we'll make note of that. So good consistency, good consistency. My pen is dying. It's more desirable. In this case, than a good average. But again, it's situational, because maybe with the tomatoes I'm making soup, and I want a high average. I want a good, good average, relative. Okay, so in general with this, specifically more with the second example, those consistent errors, the low dispersion errors, are a lot easier to correct than an error with a large dispersion. So that's that next line, in general, Consistent errors, errors can be corrected, corrected more easily than more dispersed errors. Which makes sense. Conceptually, just looking at that example, it's going to be a lot easier to fix the second person than the first. So let's use our new information about dispersion, the spread, to solve this problem. We've got two companies, A and B, and they sell 12 ounce jars of instant coffee. Five jars of each were randomly selected from markets and the contents were carefully weighed with the following results. So we've got A, their weights, and B, their weights in ounces. So which company provides more coffee in its jars? and which company fills its jars more consistently. So right off the bat, we have to figure out, well, what does it mean to say the company provides more coffee? So what kind of value are we looking for? 
we're trying to figure out which one has a higher average. Okay, the higher weight, we have more coffee. And then more consistently. Okay, so instead of having a large variation around the 12 ounce mark, okay, which one fills them more uniformly? So we want low dispersion in this case. And again, the dispersion we usually calculate and represent with standard deviation. So we want to figure out which one has the low standard deviation and which one has the higher average. So we can make the calculator do this, and we have two different data sets. A has these five, B has these five. So go into your calculator with me, and let's calculate these uh, standard deviations and the averages. So again, go into statistics, and we want to edit our lists. So go up to the top and clear out our previous list. And I'm going to do list 1 is A and list 2 is B. So I'm going to input the data from sample A. So we've got 12.02, 12.08, 11.99, 11.96, and 11.99. Okay, so we inputted all of those. We have those five data items. Click over to list 2 and we'll input those. So 12.4. Zero, it doesn't matter if we put the zero on there. 12.21, 12.36, 12 12.11, and 12.27. Now, before we even calculate these, which one has the higher average? We can just kind of look at it. B, these numbers are higher than A. So when we take the average of the larger numbers, the average is going to be bigger. But specifically, what are the averages? So we might as well calculate it. So we have our two lists, go back to statistics, over to calculate, and we inputted two lists. So now we want to select two variable stats. We've called the command, but we want to run it, so click enter. Now don't go crazy, click it around yet, because once you scroll down, you can't scroll back up with an 84, it's a pain. But that first data item was sample A. So for sample A, what was our sample mean? So X bar was 12.008. That was the average of all of the samples. And its standard deviation, S, X, as it's given in your calculator, because we were dealing with that variable, the first list, its standard deviation was 0.0. 0.455. I'll just round it there. We have a good idea. N is equal to 5. That was our first list. So now as you scroll down, you should see Y bar. That's our second variable, the second list. So for sample B, as long as you've inputted it the same that I have, if you reverse the roles, they'll be switched. Sample B, Y bar, okay, our first list was X, our second one was Y in the calculator's case. It's average 12.27. So yes, sample B's average was higher like we anticipated, but what's the standard deviation for Y, that second list? Standard deviation sample 0.1164. A lot larger. And in this case, what are the units on everything? units. The average, we're dealing with how many ounces, 12.27 ounces, 12.008, deviation by that many ounces from the mean. All right, so what can we refer about these guys? What are we thinking? Which one fills more consistently? So which one has a lower standard deviation? Sample A. Their spread around that 12 ounce mark was a lot more condensed, a lot smaller. So we can infer that A fills more consistently. A fills more consistently, consistently, since it has that lower standard deviation. And what about B? The other question that we had to ask, which one provides more coffee? 
the higher average of the two is sample B, like we could visually see in the beginning. Sample B provides more coffee. And our justification for that one was we have a higher average. Higher X bar, Y bar, doesn't matter. The variable with the line over the top. All right, so how could we make a better inference? They make so much coffee, but I only sampled five different bags in each company. If I take a larger sample size, if I take a larger sample, sample, larger sample, then we're going to have a better inference. It'll be more refined. And there's a law in statistics that talks about this, and we'll get to it a little bit later on. But if I take a larger sample, if I collected 50 different uh, bags of coffee, okay, our information would be a little bit more refined. All right, so like we saw in general, a large dispersion value, large standard deviation, means we have more spread. But when we're talking about standard deviation and spread, we can't make blanketing statements like saying, exactly half of the data points fall within two standard deviations of the mean. We don't have that kind of knowledge yet, so we can't make those blanketing statements. From the knowledge that we have. Okay, but a guy, Chebyshev, he produced a theorem that basically tells us information about those standard deviations and how many data values fall within a certain number of standard deviations. So for any set of numbers, any set, doesn't matter what the distribution is, regardless of the distribution. If it's uniform, if it's uh, binomial, if it's normal. Okay, we'll look at those later on, but it doesn't matter. Any set, this will work for. The fraction, or the part, of them that lie within k standard deviations of their mean, for k bigger than one, more than one standard deviation, is at least one minus one over k squared. So it tells us how many standard deviations we want to lie within. And this is super important in this theorem. So remember, remember, remember Chebyshev's theorem. At least that many data values lie within k standard deviations of the mean. So it's kind of vague when we just look at the definition. So let's do an example. So the first example, what is the minimum percent of items in a data set that lie within three standard deviations of the mean? So as I'm reading that question, I circle three. How many data items fit within three standard deviations or three deviations away from the mean. I would hope a whole lot of the data set, because three standard deviations is large. Okay, but we want to figure out specifically, what is the minimum number of data items that fit within those three? So our k value in this case is equal to three, because we want to figure out uh, how many lie within the three standard deviations. So one minus one over our k value squared, three squared, is what we're calculating. So we've got 1 minus 1 ninth, which is 8 ninths. Okay, you could do it on the calculator as well. Doing the division out, we get approximately 0.889. And we want it as a percentage. So as a percentage, what are we looking at there? About 88.9%. Eighty-eight point nine percent of the data items is the minimum percentage of all the data items that fit within three standard deviations of the mean. So we're going to write that down. So the minimum, there could be more, but this is the smallest uh, amount of the data items that fit within three. So eighty-eight point nine percent is the minimum percentage of items lying within three standard deviations of the mean. Okay, so if I refined it and I said, well, how much of the data fits within two standard deviations? Is this number going to go up or down? 
probably going to go down because now I've taken it from a big spread, three standard deviations from the mean, and now I've refined it. I've scooched it in. If I pick one standard deviation from the mean, I'm refining it even more, and I'm not going to have very many data items living within there. Okay, so Chebyshev's theorem, super important. Tells us a good idea. What's the minimum amount of those data items that fit within this many standard deviations from the mean? All right, so we got that one down. So we could talk about dispersion and how many fit within there, but it's all relative to the example that we're actually talking about. It's relative to the data that's present. So we need to talk about the coefficient of variation, which is basically just relating dispersion relative to the example. So another way that we describe it is the relative dispersion. Okay, so thinking back to that target shot example, it makes a d big difference if we're shooting from 100 yards versus 300 yards. Okay, it's relative to the situation. The dispersion is relative to how far away as well. So it takes into account the coefficient of variation, takes into account the central tendency. So we've been using the mean a lot when we're calculating standard deviation. That's our measure of central tendency. And at the same time, the dispersion. Okay, so much like our standard deviation, we take into account a central tendency and how far away all the data values are from that middle. But it expresses that standard deviation as a percentage of the mean. So what does that do? We calculate the standard deviation, basically, but relative to our specific example, how much of the whole is what we're asking? Okay, how much of the whole just relative to what we're looking at? Not overall. We're making it relative to our specific data. All right, so for any set, the coefficient of variation is calculated how? If we have a sample, we call it little v, and it's just the standard deviation divided by our mean, x bar, and we want it as a percentage, so we multiply it by 100%. So we've just taken our standard deviation and made it relative to our data set. Okay, so this is for a sample, and that's what we're dealing with, the majority of all our examples, they're samples. If we did have a population, though, it's just a little bit different. The standard deviation, we don't call it little s, we have it as sigma. And x bar is our mean for a sample, but the notation for the mean of a population is that mu, Greek letter mu. Again, times 100%. So we took the standard deviation, made it relative to our example, and we write it as a percentage of the whole. So this is for population. But again, we don't really deal with populations, we're dealing with samples. So just to give you an example, to hone in on what exactly are we talking about. We have two different samples here, and we'll individually talk about the spread and the averages. But we can see that A is based in the two digits around 10 to 20, okay, but B is a lot larger. But the dispersion might be smaller, we don't know. So we're going to actually calculate out, well, what is uh, the mean, the average for all of them, for sample A and sample B. What's the standard deviation? And then a relative, just to our set, what is the coefficient of variation? So grab your calculator, do it along with me, and we'll go back into statistics and edit our lists. We'll clear them out and press down, clear and press down. So I'm going to do list A uh, for list 1 and B for list 2. So I'm going to input 12, 13, 16, 18, 18, and 20. Pop over to list 2 and input 125, 131, 144, 158, 168, and 193. So go back to statistics, over to calculate, and we have two variable statistics since we put in two lists. So we'll call that command and make it run. X bar, again, is our first sample, so the mean of sample A. What was it? 16.167. We'll just round there. 
its standard deviation, we've got 3.125 units. And we'll deal with the coefficient of variation at the end to calculate it. So let's scroll down to sample B. So Y bar is 153.167. Larger fits with our values up here. And its standard deviation was what? 25.294. Okay, so if we're just comparing these values, uh, B definitely has a higher average, and it has a way larger standard deviation. But that's just relative to each other, not relative to the whole. So just relative to its own data, what is the coefficient of variation for sample A? So again, how do we calculate it? Standard deviation was 3.125, and we're dividing it by our average, 16.167, times 100%. Coefficient of variation for that one, Let me calculate real quick, 3.125 divided by 16.167 times 100, 19, about 19.33%. Okay, we want to do the same for B. Calculating again, standard deviation, 25.294, divided by our average, times 100%, is approximately what? So 25.294, divided by 153.167, move the decimal point, 16.51%. So relative to their own data sets, which one has higher dispersion? Relative to their whole, sample A. Okay, but comparing just the standard deviations to each other, standard deviation of B is way larger because those values were way larger from our data set. But relative to their own, sample A had a higher dispersion as a percentage of that sample's mean. So we'll just write that down. And I can't fit it under there. I don't think you can see it, so we'll bump over here. So A's dispersion, coefficient of variation, is larger as a percentage of that sample's mean. So relative to its own data, it had a larger dispersion compared to sample B, where the numbers were larger, but the dispersion was actually a little bit lower. All right, so you survived through 12.3. Uh, get working on the homework. I left it open through Tuesday before class, so a little bit of extra time, because I know the videos can be kind of time consuming to try to do it on your own. If you have questions, let me know. I'll be answering emails all through the weekend. See you Tuesday.